You are my hope when hope is gone. You are the strength I lean upon. You are the only light I see. You're my help in times of need. mercy will prevail and in the shadow of your wings I have no fear of anything and I'll forever sing cause you are my hope you are my strength you are my life you are my help in times of need you are my comfort and my joy and if I should fall if I should fail I will find refuge in the shadow All right, good evening, everyone. It's Wednesday and it's worship and the word. It's February 9th, which means you're, we're actually about one third of the way through the month of February. How about that? It seems like it just started. Well, we are going to uh, do something a little different tonight because it's the end of the 40 days of prayer that we've been going through as a church. Uh, it actually ends tomorrow. And it's been 40 days of prayer, 40 days of these uh, devotionals each Wednesday night. So we're going to do the final one tonight. We're going to have some time of worship, of course. We're not going to do trivia. We're going to just hold off on that for tonight and just focus on prayer. And what that means is throughout the evening, at any time, you can give prayer requests. You can tell you know, uh, someone that you need prayer or you can ask if you can pray for someone else. And I, what I'd like to see is interaction, praying for one another. We'll pray general prayers for everyone, but um, hopefully during the time of worship, um, you know, we'll get into the word a little bit and during our time of prayer, we're all praying together. You're praying, we're praying, and uh, that's how we want to end this 40 days of prayer. So before we that, do that, let's do what we always do with worship in the word, and let's kick it off with worshiping the Lord and declaring his praises. Psalms tells us that, the, that his praise will continually be on my lips. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be on my lips. Be 
tells us to pray without ceasing. So on these 40 days of prayer, I believe everything that we direct towards the Lord, whether it's a praise, a prayer, a request, a supplication, a petition, as the Bible sometimes calls it, it's prayer. Praying to God, connecting. You know, sometimes we think prayer is just about giving Him our list of requests, and it's not that. Sometimes we wait in prayer. Sometimes we're silent in prayer. Sometimes we praise in prayer. And we could do that now. But the truth is, is that we need God and we need to pray every minute. We need to have him continually being praised from our lips. We need to pray without ceasing and we need him every single hour of every single day. I need thee every hour as the hymn says.
song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I say it much better than that we need him all the time and that's why we pray guys we need him because we can try to do it without him we could try to you know go the life without prayer without seeking God but we know where that gets us we know that it's it's operating on our own strength our own faculties faculties our own abilities and uh, I promise you that's how you can fail that's how we will fail I always think about Jesus you know he was like the one guy in the world that ever lived that probably could have gotten by without prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably could, he was so powerful, you know, 100% God, 100% man. He probably could have gotten by by not praying and still been okay, yet he prayed more than anybody. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we need to follow his example. Yes, All right, so we're, we're gonna do is we're gonna get back into the, the devotional. You should have had this mailed to you. This is the 40 days of prayer. It's called the sermon outlines, but that's what we're using for our six weeks of devotional and we've gone through all six weeks we went through week week one week one was reawakening the glory of christ week two which is reawakening the life death and resurrection of christ and then week three was awakening to the spirit of christ week four was awakening to the church we talked about the church church of christ week, week five was we reawakening to the mission of Christ. That's sharing the gospel. And tonight, we're going to end with, I guess, um, a focus on the fourth of the four CMA hallmarks. Now, bear in mind, we're doing this because we're part of a Christian Missionary Alliance Church, CMA. And our four hallmarks are Jesus, our Savior, Jesus, our Sanctifier, Jesus, our Healer, and Jesus, our Coming King. And that's kind of what this last one is about. It's the reawakening to the return of Christ. And so the writer of this, um, I don't know him, Yvonne Mark, yeah, you have to meet him, but he wants us to look at Matthew 13, 6 through 13. Now this scripture is not the most pleasant, really. Um, you know, the whole Bible is pleasant because it's the word of God, but these are kind of the terrible things that take place at the end of days. He wants us to read about, and we will. And then we're going to go over some of those actual verses. It's Mark 13, 6 through um, 13. And it's, if you see in your notes, um, we're going to focus on different uh, words or phrases from several of those verses. So let me just read to you Mark 13, 6 through 13. You could follow if you have your Bible. Starting with verse 6, it says, Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. Verse 9, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me, and you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be First, be preached to all nations, it says. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Some versions will say, he who endures to the end will be saved. All right, so this is Jesus 
talking about what happens at the end of times. Um, and we'll maybe get into a little bit about, about that um, historically. But a lot of that actually took place right there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was ransacked by the Romans um, in 70 AD, probably about 30 or 20 something years after Jesus said these words. Now, some of that took place. But what Jesus was specifically talking about was the end of times. The first church felt as though, I mean, the first century church felt as though the time was going to be soon. Many thought in their lifetime. No, none thought it was soon on God's terms, uh, God's timeline, which could be 2,000 years and still be soon. Um, but it, a lot of this rolled out uh, in the first century, and some of it is yet to come. And if you have looked around, some of that is happening in this day, the day that you and I were selected to live in, the day, this modern day of the first couple decades, really, of the, of the new 20. First century, how about that? So let me just look at what we have in our notes. Verse six talks about false Christs. And that's where it said, many will come and say, I am he. This is people or leaders or entities that are set up in the modern age who are claiming to be the saviors of the world. Now, the question is, are they all claiming to be the Jewish Messiah, the, the anointed one fulfilling all the messianic prophecies? That's debatable. Some will just rise up to be the savior of the world or the saving solution to the world's problems. Um, could be either. It's not specific. I believe that Jesus was talking about false prophets as, that would rise up. Let's just look at the actual verse. It's verse 6 from chapter 13. And he says this, Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. Um, he knows at this point, it's interesting, he knows that his name, Jesus, didn't mean much to that group yet. But we know that the name of Jesus it has rolled out to be the most powerful and important name in the history of our planet, in the history of the universe. When he's talking to these people, um, he had some renown. He was popular because of miracles and being notorious, uh, you know, enemy number one of the Pharisees. But Basically, false Christs is what we're talking about. False Christ. Christ means Messiah, uh, and Messiah means Christ. That's who we need to watch out for. False the people who claim to save the world or save mankind. Let's leave that where it is. Number one, it says, how can we discern false prophets? And this is from Matthew 7, 15 through 23. If you were to turn there, you'd see this is where Jesus is saying, you know a tree by its fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit, and a good tree can't produce bad fruit. We will know, verse 20, by, uh, you, we, they, you will know them by their fruit. And this is really important, because fruit is not, uh, is, you can't be an imposter of fruit. Like, for instance, there's no way you could get a pear tree to actually grow apples. You could fasten one on there. You could you know, try to fool the world by making it think that it grew an apple, but it can't because it's a pear tree. And a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A good tree can only produce good fruit. So the fruit of the Spirit only comes from the Spirit. And I'm talking about supernatural love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Anyone can try to put those on, but in order for it to come from within, like fruit is, is um, you know, produced from within a tree and, and the, it comes forth as fruit in the leaf, within the, amongst the leaves and in the saplings, things like the, the buds and things like that. It comes from something healthy within that's, that's being produced and will eventually produce fruit in, of, in and of itself. A false prophet can't do that. In fact, a false prophet will always leave a wake of destruction, divisive, uh, hatefulness, um, you know, bitterness, uh, de deception, things like that. And Jesus says, if you're trying to discern amongst these guys, some may be convincing, but look at the fruit. And then he says in verse 7, there will be war and rumors of war. Wars and rumors of wars. And what's interesting is that um, it actually says that such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Now, there, was, there always have been wars and rumors of wars. When you visit Israel, particularly Jerusalem, one of the things that stands out is 
just a multi-thousand year history of wars. This city that is in and of itself not that geographically uh, impressive. You know, there are much more geographically impressive cities in the world, but historically, you'll never find a match for Jerusalem. And largely because there's been so many that have conquered it and reconquered it and everything from the beginning when David, you know, conquered it from the Jebusites and then Philistines would try to conquer it. And, and then, uh, you know, during Isaiah's time where, you know, Hezekiah and the Babylonians came, uh, Babylonians actually did ransack the city. And then even since that time, we've talked about it. Antiochus Epiphanius, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, the Rome and eventually um, the, the um, you know, the Muslims came in the seventh century and conquered Jerusalem. And after that time, the Byzantine era and Napoleon actually had a hand at There is so much bloodshed in the ground of Jerusalem that this, this scripture in Matthew 13, 7 could be true of any time. However, what this writer of this devotional points out is that since 1945 and the event, invention of the atomic bomb, man has a, had the ability to destroy all humanity. And you'll notice that the carnage gets worse. There's been wars even since that time having to do with Israel. And each time it seems as though that the, that the warfare, maybe not the amount of casualties, but the warfare becomes much more escalated and much more serious to the point now where it could be uh, apocalyptic. And that's, that's kind of where it's all going to. All right, so it also talks in Matthew 13, verse 8, about natural disasters and says that uh, earthquakes, there'll be earthquakes in various places, famines that are the beginning of the birth pangs, as if, you know, the birth pangs before a child is born, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, like a very tumultuous environment amongst the, uh, uh, you know, within the woman as the, as the child is about to arrive. And that's how it's described here by Matthew. Natural disasters, earthquakes. There has been a rise of earthquakes in the world. I'm told that, that um, hunger and, and things like that, famine, um, so many different pestilence throughout the world. You could see how this world, and just in our lifetime, we have seen a, tr a tremendous amount of natural disasters, pestilence, pandemic. I mean, who would have thought that you and I would, would live through that? I think it was only 2005, 2000, I think 2005, 2006, where one of the worst um, tragedies of all mankind took place, and that was the tsunami that came from, you know, the Indonesian islands and wiped out so much of the, those, pe so many of those people, hundreds of thousands. We forget about that because there have been so many natural disasters since then. Point being, is that you can make a case that we are experiencing a time in history where there are increased natural disasters, inc increased pestilence and famine and things like that. And then what about persecution in verses 9, 11, and 13? It says this, there's a report, and this is 2015, which right now is seven years ago, January 2015, over seven years ago. It said the Open Doors organization announced that the persecution of Christians around the world has reached historic levels for the modern era, and conditions suggest that it will continue to worsen. So sad, because we don't necessarily feel it in the United States. We know about it because of news, but we don't feel it. But if we lived in perhaps a Muslim country or some country, uh, you know, communist country or even some Hindu countries where it's, it's illegal to be a Christian and illegal to the point of persecution, incarceration, and maybe even martyrdom. We forget that. And then verse 10 is a verse that we at the CMA like to talk about a lot. We'll look at, we talked about it last week. And it's the gospel must be preached to all nations. The gospel must be preached to all nations, Matthew says, and then the end will come. And that's really important because now, think about it, for the first time in history, the whole world has gospel outreach, I mean, access. There was a time in our lifetime where in order to get Bibles into, you know, Eastern Bloc countries or behind the Iron Curtain, behind the Bamboo Curtain, you name it, um, 
you had to smuggle Bibles. You had to literally take bo cardboard boxes of Bibles or whatever it is and hide them in cars and you know, putting them in, in, in the bodies and fenders of vehicles and try to get them across the border without being detected. And if they were, you could lose your life or at least spend a long time in jail in some Soviet bloc country or something like that. This is in our lifetime, my lifetime. Now, every nation in the world has some access to you know, the internet and most people of the world at some point in their life will be able to experience, whether it's read, hear, see video of the gospel. That's amazing because that was never that way. And um, scripture tells us that that has to happen to precede the end times. That was not the case in the time of Jesus and the apostles in the first century. And then this talks about the destruction of the family unit, which is, is really important. It says, brother will betray brother to death, the father to child, children will rebel against parents and have them put to death. And I think what Mark is saying here is that the importance of a family, which is really one of the most sacred uh, you know, cornerstones of any society has come undone. And there's disrespect and uh, division and, and um, even deception with turning child against parent and sibling against sibling. And we see it now it's amongst little things. Can you imagine when more persecution comes our way? So, not good news, but the end is near. And the end ends well where it says if we endure it to the end you will say God wins in the end you'll see and then the second part of this is the coming of the son of man and this is verses 24 through 26 in the same chapter and he says but in those days following the distress the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken at that time people will see the son of man coming on the clouds with great power and glory and uh, that's a sight to behold I imagine that's something that that um, if we are alive and God willing we will will be the m most impressive event in in anyone's lifetime Jesus coming on the clouds with power can you imagine all right um, and then it, it says what do we know we don't know when but we know that it's near and Philippians 4, 5 talks about the nearness. Let's move on to section B. And it says, we know the following. Okay, so here's what we know. His return is imminent. Imminent means about to happen. We read in Revelations, uh, Revelation 22 and 12 and 20, same chapter, verses 12 and 20, both say, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. But number two, it says, it will be personal. And then we talk about Acts 1.11 and Thessalonians 4.16. Acts 1.11 is when the angels tell those just after Jesus ascended, hey, he's going to come back just like he left. So keep that in mind. Keep looking to the sky. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a command, the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet. Very much like what we just read in Mark 13, when Jesus comes back with power. And then three, it will be visible. It will be visible. Um, Revelation, when it first started, John saw Jesus in his vision and he actually felt his hand. And then four, it said it will be pre-millennial. Why is this important? Um, we believe in a pre-millennial return of Jesus. As you study eschatology, uh, you'll see that there's many points of view, many um, different beliefs about the timeline as it rolls out basically is that once the great tribulation starts it's a seven year period three and a half years and then a change uh three and a half years and then it turns evil really uh and then jesus comes back at the end of that seven years before the 1000 years which we call the millennium um you know our belief is that jesus comes back to take us up then he returns with power and glory with the angels and binds Satan for a thousand years. And then there's the millennial period. That's an eschatological study that will take some time. If we wanted to get into it, you could do that at any time. Uh, just look at Revelation towards the end of, of Revelation from probably the midway through toward the end. 
And then it says in C, it says, this is our blessed hope and it should propel us to a holy life of service. Really, I think we need to remind ourselves. Sometimes we forget. You know, um, there was a time where, as Christian slogans go, one of the more popular ones was Jesus is coming soon. Or you'd see people with bumper stickers, t-shirts, or labels, whatever it might be, that say Maranatha, which also means Jesus is coming soon. And uh, I don't know if that was a trend or not, um, there was a lot of books that came out about when Jesus is coming soon. Some made false predictions about the date that he was coming. And it seems as though maybe because of all that, that rolled out with that and he didn't come to our expectations uh, we, that we had hoped, we forget. And maybe we, we've given up on the idea of keeping that, those words in our language regularly. Jesus is coming soon or Maranatha or he's our soon coming king. Well, you want to know something, this is for certain, that Jesus' return is closer today than it ever was in history. It's closer to this day, February 9th, 2022, than it ever was in history. And that's true. And then the third section, it says, what can we do? And the answer is watch. The answer is watch. And he gives us Mark, same chapter, 13 verses 33 through 37 it says be on guard be alert you do not know when the time will come it's like a man going away and he leaves his house and puts his servants in charge each with their assigned task and tells the one at the door to keep watch therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows at dawn if he comes suddenly do not let him find you sleeping what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, watch. And that word Gregorio in Greek is the word watch or be awake and stay vigilant. Keep watch. And it appears six times in that chapter and the next. But in those six times, telling us to watch, telling us to wait and watch. It literally means to stay awake and watch. And so the question that is asked here is, as this 40 days of prayer study is closed, are you alert? Are you awake? And are you ready? Ready yourselves would be the, would be the response to that. You know, guys, here's, here's what I believe. Is I do believe Jesus is coming back. And I believe, well, this guy says too, I believe that Jesus came today. He asks, am I ready? Do I have an awareness? Am I utilizing my time in a way to give God honor, to fulfill his commission? Will I regret, regret how I spend my time when I stand face to face with him? Can I say that I'm watching with urgency that the scriptures ex exhort me? And finally, at the announcement of, of Jesus in Revelation, can I genuinely say, like John did, and this is what John said when it was all over, he said, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Or do I have reservations? Do you sometimes think, mm, I hope he doesn't come back today. There's things I like better than Jesus or better than the idea of going to heaven and reigning with him. Never let anything become more important than him or his mission or the kingdom of God. But I want to add this, and this is not in the notes. I want to end with this. In Luke 19, Jesus gives a parable. It's the parable of the ten minas. And it talks about a nobleman going away and leaving the people, you know, his, um, the, the workers of his land in charge. And the idea was, I'm going to go away and look at another piece of land and why I'm here you guys make the best of the land, work the land, invest the money, whatever it is, this, this estate, and so that you turn a profit when I come back. And uh, as it turns out, some of those did, and they were rewarded, and some were not, and they were punished, at least one. But something he says in the middle of that parable, middle of that parable, when the landowner leaves, he says something to them. He says, I will be back. And Luke 19, 13 says, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. And you know what that means? Is don't stop and wait for me to come back. Don't stop what you're doing and, and just cram when you hear word that I'm going to come back. Occupy. Do the things that you're meant to do here on earth every day, every year, every week. You know, I believe this is if we're already about the kingdom of God, and I believe we are. I think if you're, if you're watching this, you're probably someone who's seeking God. You're seeking him tonight. 
you're probably seeking him in his life. And as he reveals his will to you, what you're to do with your time, your talents, your resources, the giftedness that God's given you, just do it. Do it with all you've got. Obviously, you want to keep a rest for a Sabbath, as we see in Hebrews uh, 4 and other places. But you want to work diligently as a worker who will be, is worthy of their wages. And when he returns, he says to you and he says to me, well done, good and faithful servant. And when you know you're going to get a, a well done, pat on the back from Jesus, then you will say, like John did, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what we have for you tonight. That's the end of our series, the 40 Days of Prayer series. And here's the end of our 40 days. In fact, we're going to end it tomorrow night. I hope you could come out to uh, the Bellworks meeting room uh, at 7 o'clock Thursday. It's February 10th. Because we're going to pray and we're going to worship a little. And we're really going to kind of galvanize and solidify all the sentiments of prayer that we lifted up for these 40 days. And hopefully we'll have a gathering there. Uh, we normally do have a few, but maybe we'll have more. Either way, it's about praying. It's about asking, seeking, beseeching the Lord for the things that are on our hearts. Um, so what we're going to do right now is close this time in a little bit different. I'm going to play some prayer music like I normally do when Allie comes up, and she'll come up. But I want to ask you to pray. Pray online. Just offer a prayer request, or better yet, Look for a prayer request and pray for it. If someone says, pray for my health or my loved one, go ahead and do it. Don't be afraid to do it. And um, we're going to end our time with just praying and maybe we'll sing another verse of Lord, I need you. And that'll be it for Worship in the Word for this night, the final night of the 40 days of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I'm just coming before you and um, just want to just really pray, God, that you do open up our eyes and, and um, keep us awake during this time, Lord. Help us to see where you're leading. We pray, God, that you lead us um, th with your spirit, that we would just go and, and go where you want us to go and do what you want us to do, Lord. Um, just want to lift up some things to you, Lord. There's so many that we know that are sick right now we're just praying right now lord just against covid we pray for all of those that are sick with covid and so many that are sick with other things lord we're lifting them up to you also lifting up people that we know that are dealing with depression lord we do pray god that you would be their hope that you would just instill them with your hope also praying for many that are dealing with addiction lord we do pray god that you would rescue them be with them and many that have lost loved ones lord we are lifting them up to you lord we pray god that you would be their comfort and many also that are dealing with uh, financial issues and just uh, lack of peace in their families lord we do pray god that you would just be their peace lord that they would just uh, walk in your spirit and tap into the gifts of your spirit we're praying that your peace would just cover them lord and heal them lift all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I want you to uh, go ahead and offer a prayer, prayer request or a prayer for someone online. I'm going to ask anyone that has a physical need to just go ahead and put that out there. Something for yourself or for a loved one that we can pray for. And let's pray. Someone that has a situational need, something that they're facing. Maybe it's with your job. Maybe it's with your finances. Maybe it's something else. Put that out. Let us pray. Someone has a relational need, having to do with a child, a parent, a brother, a sister, a loved one. You don't have to be too personal, but just put it out there. We'll pray for that someone has a spiritual need maybe there's something that you feel that's blocking you or keeping you from experiencing the life in the spirit that you know God has for you maybe it's anger or fear or bitterness or unforgiveness or maybe you don't know what it is but put it out there just say even unspoken need or pray for me 
Boy, I'll tell you, there's, there's nothing more appealing to the heart of God than a contrite heart. He says, a contrite heart I'll never cast out. He loves to see us confess our weaknesses and just a simple pray for me. I believe the Lord will respond and we will respond. And so Lord, you know what our brothers and sisters offer up. You know the prayer requests. You've seen them, you know even deeper than what's written and what's spoken. You can see our hearts. And I do pray that you'll reach into every one of my brother and my sister that offered up a prayer request, whether it was spoken, written, or just implied and thought about in the depth of the heart. I do pray that you'll respond. I pray that you'll bring healing to those that are in desperate need of a touch of your healing hand. I pray that you'll bring healing to situations and uh, provision for those that have financial needs or job need or housing need. I pray, God, for for restoration and reconciliation for those who have relational issues that have kept them from fully experiencing a life of love and fellowship with their loved ones who you intended them to live their life with. And I do pray, God, for those that are experiencing a spiritual need like anger, fear, disenchantment, maybe even lack of faith, that you touch them with your healing hands as well. Show yourself strong. Be strong for those that have confessed that they're weak. And anyone that just says, pray for me, you know the need. You know the need, Lord. We don't even need to articulate it. We pray that you'll meet those needs. And then in this time of prayer, Lord, you know our three main areas that we're praying for. And one is the health of the church. And first and foremost, that we pray that we'd be spiritually healthy, that we would gird ourselves up with the full armor of God, the loins girded with truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, breastplate of righteousness, and the shield of faith. And that we would not be pushed around by the enemies, but that, Lord, that we would be a church that the gates of hell would not prevail against, that we'd be a healthy church, a strong church, a church that is balanced, a church that is mature, a church that doesn't lean to the left or to the right in areas where we go outside of your will, a church that knows your will and stays on the course, puts our hand to the plow, does not look back and does not look to the left or to the right, that we are regularly in the word of God, regularly in prayer, that your praise is continually on our lips and our worship to you, that we have a handout to reach those that are in need, in desperate need, whether it's physical need, material need, but mostly for spiritual need. And that most importantly, Lord, that we're a church that honors you, that honors you in the things we say and do, honors you in the plans we have, the decisions we make. And then also we pray for our, our health, our physical health, We know that there are many that are sick among us. There's those that are suffering from things like COVID and other diseases throughout the winter, things that have other chronic issues that that they suffer with and have for years. And we pray that you would be Jesus, our healer, and heal physical healing to those that suffer in our congregation. And Lord, we also pray for the issues of the world, of which there are many. We think about the wars and rumors of wars in places like Ukraine and even places in Africa where we don't even hear about things that are going on with Boko Haram and the the extreme Muslims that are taking over villages, creating child soldiers, and we forget about that. That continues to happen. Other places, Father, where there's, there's bloodshed on a regular basis, And as we talked about tonight, even persecution and martyrdom of Christians, we pray for relief and protection from all those who are marked for destruction and death. And Lord, we pray for our political situation. It just seems that the enemy loves to divide us and laugh, divide and conquer, even the church. Oh Lord, would you allow us the ability to look through the eyes of the Spirit, open the eyes of our heart, like you talk about in Ephesians, that we would not see what's being presented to us through media, through politics, through uh, the agendas and propaganda of this world. That we would be those that can see beyond that, see through it, not be jaded 
with eyes of deception, but with eyes of the Spirit, that we would see you with clarity. And Lord, we do pray for the pandemic. We thank you, God, that there seems to be a, a light at the end of the tunnel. There seems to be a, a decrease in cases. We don't know. We do know that it's serious and it has caused so much heartache and death and sickness and pain. And we pray that you would be rid of it, Lord, <laughs> that you'd heal the earth yes. of that disease, of that virus. And then, Lord, we pray finally that this year, 2022, that we would see the blessing of many people coming to faith, many people who have rejected the gospel in the past, that he, they would accept you, that, that you would be welcomed into the hearts and minds of people who, whether they're atheists or, or agnostic, unbelievers, skeptics, whoever it might be, that they would open their heart and by faith receive the forgiving grace that you offer everyone, whosoever will. Father, would you give us the blessing of seeing it? We give us the blessing of being able to rejoice, just like the angels in heaven rejoice for each sinner that turns to repentance. So we thank you, Lord, for this time that we call the 40 days of prayer. I pray that it doesn't stop us from praying. I pray that we'll just continue on with the 365 days of prayer each year, that we pray and we we seek your face, that we never stop praying. We, we continually lift up our needs, the needs of others around us, that we would continually ask so that we would receive, that we would continually declare our dependence upon you, knowing that you are the only one that can provide. Every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights, and so we have nowhere else to turn. So in these 40 days, we thank you that you, we believe you've heard our prayer, we wait in anticipation, hopeful anticipation, as we see your miraculous hand respond to our prayers. And we trust you, Lord, and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this again. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Thank you for being with us on this special edition of Worship in the Word, the 40 Days of Prayer. Thank you for praying with us and journeying uh, through with us. And like I prayed, uh, my prayer is that, and my hope is that we continue to be a church that prays, that this house, our house, our church, would be called a house of prayer. So let's continue this new year to, to lift up our knees, to, to bear one another's burdens, and, and to ask the Lord. Remember, we have not sometimes because we ask not. Don't be afraid to ask the Lord for the things you just asked him. You can continue to continually ask. But for every need that comes about, don't despair. Don't worry when there's tribulation and trial and trouble. Just ask. Pray without ceasing. God bless you.